All right, Joel, thank you for doing this. Why don't you just walk us through the results of the study first, and then we'll talk about what it means. Sure. Um, so what this was is a phase one dose escalation study, primarily designed to um, evaluate safety at various doses. And so the, I think there were 45 people enrolled. They were given escalating doses in groups, and tolerance essentially was, uh, was the endpoint. Um, at the highest dose levels, not surprisingly, there were local reactions. Um, none of those were severe, and um, basically they sort of sent the signal that the highest dose was probably going to be higher than tolerated. But then since they were vaccinating these volunteers at various doses, they collected samples, including plasma and serum samples and assayed antibodies. And the, I think, good news result from this fairly small study is that even at the lowest dose, there were antibody responses. The higher, the next higher dose um, had a higher frequency and apparently higher concentrations of the kind of functional antibodies that we think are needed, that is neutralizing antibodies. Um, and so I think um, the results are such that they are um, being used to plan a next stage larger um, uh, study with selected doses and looking at maybe vaccine side effects that are less frequent. In other words, with a, with a small group like this, you will only see the most frequent side right. effects. Right. So it's t you, you, you taught us a week ago about the different types of vaccines. What kind of vaccine is this? So this is an RNA vaccine. And as you know, RNA is a fragile molecule, very easily degraded by very ubiquitous RNAs. And so it is RNA encapsulated into a lipid nanoparticle. In other words, a lipid shell used both to protect the RNA from degradation and actually then to deliver it to the interior of cells where the RNA then codes for the antigen protein, and that protein is what's um, uh, directed, uh, what the antibodies are directed to. So there's an RNA uh, put in a lipid shell, it goes in and then it, it creates uh, the body then, does, is it making then, it's not making virus, it's making, what, what is it making that then the body's <laughs> coming up with antibodies? It's, it's only making one viral protein, and that's the spike protein that is on the virus. It's located on the outside of the virus, so it's accessible mm -hmm. to antibodies. Um, but there's no virus. There's just one molecule of RNA. It's translated into protein, and that protein is recognized by the immune system as non-self, and so mounts an antibody response to it. And as you talked through the different types of, uh, of, of vaccines uh, when we last spoke last week, uh, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this particular type? The advantages are several. One, um, it's pretty clear now that this can be produced in large quantities pretty rapidly. Um, there's enough of a track record so far to know what, what pitfalls need to be avoided in production of vaccine-grade RNA. Um, another advantage is maybe hypothetical, but nevertheless has been a safety concern in the past with DNA vaccines. So DNA vaccines are another alternative. There have been concerns voiced about whether injecting foreign DNA into people and potentially having it incorporated into their cells could be hazardous, maybe at a low frequency, but nevertheless um, could be hazardous. So this skips any concern that vaccine DNA could be incorporated into cells, um, which would then potentially be altered in their function and their genotype. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that really was a phase one trial was really designed to see if it was safe. Finding the antibodies, uh, is that typical in a phase one study? You sort of, you look at efficacy outcomes or you're normally just doing it to be sure of safety? It's not really an efficacy outcome. It's called an immunogenicity outcome. Right. And, you know, as long as you're vaccinating people, you might as well get some information out of it besides, <laughs> does your arm hurt and do you have a fever? Right. Um, and so it's pretty common, I think, in, in phase one vaccine trials to collect samples and determine whether there's an immune response. Now, 
sometimes that's not adequate or the sampling isn't optimum, things like that, because this, the design of phase one is really for safety. Mm -hmm. And so not infrequently, the immunogenicity is reserved for later stages, um, stage two. Uh, but in this case, you know, I, and I think it's becoming increasingly common that at phase one, you might as well collect samples. And even though the sample number, sample size is small, you can get a hint about whether the vaccine is inducing an immune response. It doesn't say anything about whether that immune response is protective, but at least you can say you can measure an immune response, which is good news. So I assume if, if, if they had seen no immune response, this vaccine would have been dead in the water. So seeing right. immune response doesn't tell us for sure that it's going to be efficacious, but it, it, the, the opposite result would have been very bad. I, I, that's absolutely right, particularly because at the highest dose, there were toxicities. So you wouldn't be able to say, oh, well, maybe we were just too low in the dose. Let's increase the dose because I think at this, at the upper dose level here, you know, there were what sounded like toxicities that were substantial enough that you wouldn't really want to give it out or right. increase the dose further. So take us through the next steps that one has to go through to figure out whether this works. And I'm not asking so much in the way a trial will be done. We'll get to that in a second. But I assume we, we now know there are antibodies. We now know there are neutralizing antibodies. We don't know for sure those actually work. We don't know for sure those how long they last. Is that the kind of thing that you're, you're thinking as you interpret this? That's exactly right. Um, we also don't know what else is induced by the vaccine regimen so far. In other words, all we know about so far are that the, in this study, the vaccine induced antibodies. The antibodies, at least in some of the people, at least some of the antibodies had neutralizing activity. We don't know about other activities, for example, T cell responses. Um, there was probably a T cell response, at least a CD4 response, because that's necessary to get a good antibody response, but CD8 T cell responses will be worth knowing about in future studies. Because they're going to help with efficacy, or are there problems with other responses that might cause, cause uh, difficulties? Uh, I mean, the hope is that they could contribute to efficacy. In other words, we know that CD8 T cells in certain contexts provide defense against viral infections because they can recognize a viral infected cell and kill that cell. And a dead cell can't be used by a virus to produce more viruses. Um, so I think it's something to be on the lookout for. It may not be necessary. We talk about correlates of immunity and mechanisms of immunity, and they aren't always the same. Mm -hmm. um, we can measure neutralizing antibodies, but if neutralizing antibodies actually aren't a mechanism of immunity and only mucosal antibodies are a mechanism, for example, then neutralizing antibodies are a correlate, but not a mechanism of immunity. So these, these might be real antibodies, but having them may not be protective against you getting sick from the virus. That's possible. I think there, there are other data suggesting that neutralizing antibodies will be important, but I think we can't be sure and, and assume so um, in the absence of data. Okay. So take us through what the next stages of testing are. So the next stages obviously include an expanded safety trial. In other words, with 45 subjects, you're only going to see the um, most common side effects. And, and you know, basically things like local site injection pain, maybe a fever, that sort of thing. So it's necessary to expand the number so that rare um, side effects are more likely to be captured. It's also important, and I know that this is actually planned, to expand into different groups, including older people. So the upper age cutoff of these subjects was 55 years. So mm -hmm. we know that older people are more susceptible to bad outcomes with SARS-CoV-2. So it's necessary and important to determine whether the same vaccine and the same vaccine dose is immunogenic in people over the age of 55 as well. Got it. All right, so next phase, <clears throat> much bigger trial, so you'll start seeing um, uh, rare or less common side effects. When do you begin getting at the specific issue of does it work? So that ordinarily would be a phase 2B or a phase 3 trial. In other words, you would 
expand a phase two trial, and in some cases, try to get some efficacy data. Um, phase three is really where things are compared to other existing um, alternatives. And so I think we're quite a ways away from phase 2B. Um, and, you know, it needs to be done. I think it needs to be planned one of two ways. Protection studies can either be done in very large populations at risk, and you vaccinate some and don't vaccinate others, or there are other study designs like we're employed with, with, with Ebola vaccination, for example. Um, those are expensive, they take a long time, and are majorly affected by fluctuations in the frequency of, of a disease. The other alternative that's being discussed and that's been used in other contexts is, is a human challenge study. In other words, people are vaccinated um, or not, um, and then actually challenged with the pathogen of interest. Now, those are generally done with pathogens for which there's a curative therapy. In mm -hmm. other words, they're done for malaria. Um, a colleague of mine does this with Neisseria vaccines. In other words, you watch for evidence that a person develops a fever and treat them immediately with a drug that you know that the challenge strain is susceptible to. We don't have that advantage in the case of SARS-CoV-2. And so human challenge studies are risky when you don't have a treatment and you don't really have the ability to predict in advance which subjects are high, at a high risk for, for a bad outcome. One possible approach to that is to use a challenge strain that is either somewhat attenuated or has what we call a kill switch. In other words, a way to say, okay, we know enough about whether this person has developed infection or not, and now we can stop the infection, you know, with a, with a designed challenge virus. Um, and so there's work, including here at UCSF, um, oriented at trying to develop challenge strains that could potentially facilitate. So they're close enough to the virus, but they have something different about them that allows you to, to abort the, the, the course of the virus. Right. And those are human challenge studies, if they can be done safely are much less expensive and they are much more rapid than a population. So study. a challenge study is I'm gonna take 100 people and I'm gonna give them the vaccine or half of them the vaccine and I'm gonna blow SARS-CoV-2 up their nose and see you know, what happens to them? It, 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 100 would be a pretty good, pretty good sample size. They can, they're, they're often done with fewer. Uh -huh. um, I imagine there's a problem with, if you're doing it with the regular virus, the, the population that would be the least likely to get sick and therefore, it might be ethical to do the, the vaccine, uh, the challenge study is not the population that you're most worried about. And so right. it may not give you the answer to what it would be like to vaccinate an 80 year old. Is That's that, absolutely that right. right. Yeah. The, other, the other thing you have to keep in mind is if you're challenging somebody with a pathogen that can circulate in the population, you want to keep that person out of the population for a while. Right, right, right. But then if you're doing a population study, you would sort of have to land it in New York in March, where you, you're in the very early phase of a right. huge outbreak, and then you'll right. be able to tell. Other than that, it's a little dicey. Right. I mean, the first efforts at Ebola vaccine trials were finally organized during the tail of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. And so testing those was really badly limited by the fact that the disease was actually going away on its own at that point. If everything goes perfectly here, it turns out to be safe when tested in a thousand or however many people, and then we move to either challenge studies or a large scale, more kind of natural experiment study. Uh, when's the earliest that, uh, that uh, I can get my vaccine? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. Um, is, it, is it three months or is it a year? Oh, it's, or it's, I would say closer to a year than three months. Uh -huh. thank, you, thank you for giving me that window. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's more than six months. Um, I would say six to nine to 12 months at, at a bare minimum. I mean, and, and part of it is just the organizational challenges of getting the trials done. Second is in, in this initial dose finding trial, there were two doses of vaccine given a month apart. And then, and, and so not all of the subjects have actually been, been analyzed yet at the highest doses because they only got their second dose a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. 
Um, so there's that time factor. And then I think in, in the case of less common side effects, you want to wait a while and make sure that there isn't something that shows up a few months after uh, vaccination. Yeah, although I guess you, I could imagine you could argue that in a one in a thousand side effect, if you're talking about vaccinating people in a nursing home in a, an endemic area, you'd probably Absolutely. be willing to accept it. So you really balance that against the risk of the disease itself. Right, right. Wow. Okay, a week or 10 days ago, you were not enthusiastic about the prospect of a vaccine, and you, I believe, thought that a, uh, a, a treatment, effective treatment, would be the first thing that happened, and I think you gave us a date of July 2021. Just, as, just so you know, I was listening. Uh, tell me you have a good memory, too. Yeah, tell me what your thinking is today. I'm still reserved. I mean, I, I am encouraged by these results, but they're really very early results, and we don't have, a, 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 don't have efficacy data yet. I still think we're a year and a half away from being able to roll out a vaccine that's accessible to a, a significant slice of the population. You're absolutely correct that the highest risk people at highest risk should be prioritized. Um, but I think that just the logistics of vaccine development, the safety testing, the production and, um, and you know, distribution of the vaccine is probably be on the 12 to 18 month time frame. But it sounds like if you were thinking that there was a decent chance that we wouldn't get to a vaccine in the next couple of years that you're thinking has shifted in the more optimistic direction based on the results today? I think my optimism comes and goes. Um, okay. <laughs> I think it's, it's, I mean, there's no question in my mind that ending this pandemic will only be accomplished by a good vaccine or more than one good vaccine. In terms of a breakthrough that halts things, makes life more tolerable and lets things get back to more usual, I think we're still a year to a year and a half away from that kind of breakthrough with a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. This is incredibly helpful and interesting. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see people see it and that they're seeing it through their own lens of, you know, do you get really optimistic or sounds like the stock market liked it. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> quite, a, quite a bit. Quite a bit but it, uh, it, it's going to be important to temper all that with the number of uh, a lot of steps that we saw to get to, uh, to an effective vaccine. All right. All right. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it.